<laughs> I'm not yet a PowerPoint expert. Um, I still have 20 pretty days left on it. <laughs> so we should be okay, but, uh, but still. Um, I'm going to offer some uh, comments and I hope some information and some examples and so on. Um, all of them kind of rallying around the, the banner, so to speak, of her object behavior in Ruby, which is to say ways in which um, objects can sort of differentiate themselves and individuate themselves specifically from other objects of the class from which they originate. Now, this may sound either like kind of dry or sort of arbitrary topic. I hope I'll make the case that, that it's neither. Um, and it's also something that's been kind of dear to my heart for a long time. Um, I have been accused by no less than Zen Spider of being obsessed with singleton methods. Um, when he said this to me, he sounded very troubled, and I, I tried to reassure him, but I couldn't quite deny it. That would have been kind of dishonest. So in fact, I am sort of obsessed with singleton methods. Um, singleton methods are really a big part of what makes objects kind of behave individually in Ruby, and I, I maintain it will try to sort of make the case that objects behaving individually in Ruby is really important and really um, and really kind of interesting. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about singleton methods. I'm also going to talk a little bit about extend, which is, I think, a, a very powerful and sometimes kind of neglected technique. Um, now, what, in terms of what's kind of at stake here, what's really at stake in part, um, well, there's a couple of things. But one thing that I think is, is at stake is the question of making changes to the core behavior of Ruby. Now, have any of you made changes to the core behavior of Ruby? Go on, so you can admit it. <laughs> yeah, now, as you know, if you do that, that is to say, if you kind of intervene in an existing class, which is really easy, I mean, it's actually trivial in Ruby, you just go, you know, class array, dev, so on, so on. If you do that, you open a bit of a Pandora's box, which is, you change the class for every object of that class in the entire sort of object space, which is almost, in some cases, you know, if, you're, if your method has a really weird name or you really kind of are aggressive about like doing this like with Rails, like everyone knows that Rails changes things, right? And it's just sort of in your face and you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna not know it or kind of stumble, because you're sort of, that's sort of part of the bargain, right? But if you just kind of put things in subtly, kind of ad hoc, it can really, it can really cause problems specifically. I think of it as kind of a prisoner's dilemma that, you know, one of these, well, if I make core changes and then you make a core change with the same name, that's no good, but then shouldn't one of us get to do it? You know, so which of us gets to do it and how do we decide? Um, and the answer is basically that you can't, you know, you essentially have to not do it. Um, extend is, a nice technique because it lets you basically take an individual object and do whatever you want with it. I mean, here I can add, and this is kind of a, a non-example, but just imagine that that shuffle thing had you know, one, of, one of the shuffle implementations in it from the earlier slide. I can basically say, okay, I'm going to have a shuff shuffleable, suddenly looks weirdly spelled, I guess there's no sort of good way to spell the shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, a module that, right, and I define this method, and, and then I extend an object with it. I have a specific array, and I extend this array with shuffleable, and suddenly that array and that array only can be shuffled. And what's nice about that is it kind of compartmentalizes this, so you can make what amounts to a change in the core, or the, let's say the behavior of a core object, um, or an object of a core class without actually changing the, the whole system underlying it. Now, this brings in the question of classes themselves and their role in per object behavior. Um, I think these are both sort of paraphrases from memory. I think they're pretty close. They, Dave Thomas gave a keynote address a few weeks ago at RailsConf. Were some of you at Rails? I know some of you. Who was at RailsConf? Did you hear Dave's talk? Right. And one of the slides that I thought was really very interesting and kind of thought provoking was the one that said it's object oriented, not class oriented. And when he said it, he meant like object oriented programming. In other words, his point was 
there's a lot of kind of talk about classes and, and using classes and inheriting the classes and all this kind of thing. And it's not that there's no place for that, but he was reminding us that really kind of the, the, the heart and soul of this programming paradigm that we're, we're all you know, using, at least those of us who are Ruby and other such languages, the heart and soul of it is really the object. And I think this is very, very true of Ruby. And I sort of took that slide. In a sense, seeing that slide was what started me <laughs> thinking about kind of putting together some ideas and, and sort of rallying around that, that thought. Um, and I'm going to expand a little bit more on, on you know, why I think that's important, too. Another, again, just paraphrase from memory, is something that Matt said on the Ruby Talk mailing list a few years ago, which was, well, somebody was asking about inheritance, and there was a kind of discussion going on about, you know, does this inheritance tree, whatever it was, I don't remember, you know, does it model real life correctly and all that kind of thing? And, you know, it's kind of, kind of examination of some of those issues, and somebody was asking about um, inheritance, and Matt said, at most, it's a shared implementation. And what he meant was basically, you have two classes, you know, class A and class B, and they're going to share a lot of methods. They're going to share a lot of implementation. And one, way, one sort of shorthand for doing that is inheritance. And he was kind of downplaying the idea that you're really creating a sort of hierarchy that reflects, you know, something in the world or some natural thing and, and so forth, and really just saying this is just a way of saying I have two classes and they share a lot, so this is one way to make them share a lot. Um, not even necessarily the only way. You can also do similar things with modules and so forth. There's always some question in my mind about, you know, when I hear discussions about object-oriented programming representing the real world. My, I don't know about your real world. My real world is sort of like um, procedural more with a lot of, um, throwing a lot of exceptions. <laughs> no, object oriented is a little bit kind of ideal, I guess. But, but anyway, I mean, there's obviously, literally, you know, books to be, or have been, and will be written about the question of sort of modeling the world and so on. But anyway, Max's comment I thought was also very kind of thought provoking. Um, and sort of putting these together kind of dialectically, so to speak, we also have the. Um, the state of things in Ruby where the class of an object is not the same as its type. Now, this also, if you if you have six months off at some point and want to read the archives of the Ruby Talk mailing list on this topic, please feel free. I'm giving you the short version. Basically, class is not type in the sense that every object in the in sort of the Ruby space, Ruby object space, every object is launch is kind of bootstrapped into existence through a class. And it always has that class. And that class will always be part of the sort of method lookup chain of the object and so on. But on the other hand, objects also have their own, it's sort of their own destiny, to put it, you know, sort of melodramatic. Every object, potentially at least, has its own behavior, its own, um, its own type, essentially. And so, the word type, although it, it's, it's used a lot as a synonym for class in discussions of Ruby, that's kind of a waste of the word. In other words, we have the word class. That means the class, when you say object.class, what's the answer to that? You know, array, thing, whatever. Yeah. The idea of type as something that's not a synonym for class, but something that really essentially means kind of a snapshot of that object, that particular object at that particular time, um, it's a very kind of elusive concept. In some ways, it's a very unnecessary concept. I mean, objects just kind of do what they do, what, you know, whatever, however you want to characterize the type. But still, I think it's an, it's an interesting and important distinction. Now, in discussions of this, often thrown back at me has been, you know, oh, come on. You don't really run around defining new methods on every you know, instance of every class. You know, that's just going to get kind of ridiculous, right? Um, but in fact, there are some common cases of this. For instance, what we refer to as class methods in Ruby. 
Basically, reg x and array, in this example, are both classes, which means they're both instances of the class class. And by the way, my experience tells me that the answer to 75% of all questions about Ruby is because classes are also objects. So keep that in mind. And here, you know, there they are, reg x and array. Those are objects. If you ask reg x, uh, reg x um, to perform union, it will. Array has no idea what you're talking about. So basically, that's a case where these two objects, these two instances of, of a particular class, in this case the class class, have gone their separate ways. They're not behaving the same way. Um, now, you might say, OK, but a class is a special case. A class method is kind of special. Uh, instance of the singleton method. It is and it isn't. I mean, I think one of the cool things about Ruby is that a lot of the special, a lot of special cases are sort of in the eyes of the beholder. I mean, really, it, you're basically just defining singleton methods on these class objects. It's a little bit, there's a little bit of special casing when it comes to inheritance with, with class methods. But still, basically, you're just taking class objects and adding methods to them. And the result is that you have these objects behaving in kind of an individuated way. One of the things that I was looking at, that I have been looking into a little bit um, recently is prototyped languages like self, for example. Um, I wish I could say that I was more further along with the study of them than I am at the moment. Um, Self intrigues me a great deal. I find it a bit of a hard nut to crack, partly because it has a somewhat kind of small talk like environment, which is fine, but I'm so unused to it and I haven't, I, I can't claim to have really learned it, um, but I'm you know, trying to kind of plug away at it. Um, but anyway, in terms of Ruby and, and the idea of prototype language, basically the idea of a classless object oriented language. Um, in Ruby, you can kind of pretend that you're in a prototype language. I mean, and actually, I'm going to show you a, some code in a, in a few minutes, um, just a little sort of example, a kind, of, kind of proof of concept or test of concept, anyway, of, of writing something without classes. Um, but in Ruby, you can actually kind of pretend that you're in a prototype language, and that every object really just is kind of, um, you know, the, the Origin of every of other objects without without actually instantiating classes. Um, on the other hand, it's really kind of a hybrid situation. There are classes in Ruby. It's not like self. Have any of you have any of you know self or have looked at self? It looks really cool. I sort of want to you know break my mind into it so that I can really look at it in depth, but. Um, but unlike self and languages like that, Ruby does have classes. So there's no, you know, one can't say it's a class of language or it's, um, it's a prototype language. In fact, what's really kind of intriguing about this is that Ruby's per object behavior involves a class design. In other words, the reason we can sort of pretend that we're in this prototype universe where <coughs> Uh, where objects, you know, where you sort of don't have to think about what class an object comes from, and you just attend to its type in the sense of its behaviors, its kind of profile at a given moment in execution. What makes this possible in Ruby, perhaps paradoxically, at least ironically, a little bit, is these singleton classes. Essentially, when you add a method to an object directly, what you're actually doing is you're defining an instance method of that object singleton class. So the way Ruby implements the whole idea of per object behavior is through this kind of second, it's almost like a second skin. Every object has, you know, has the class from which it's sprung, you know, string, array, automobile, whatever it may be. And then in addition to the class from which it's sprung, it has or it can have for for efficiency reasons it technically doesn't until you, you bring it into being, but it has or can have this kind of second class, this other class that's really just for, the, for its own, for the object's own private 
storage of methods that, that can only be called on that object. And Matz, again, just thinking about some of the things that Matz has said in the past about this, he's very focused on the idea of per object behavior and much less focused on the class design. He's actually said in the future he might, or he sort of reserves the right, so to speak, to think of a way to implement per object behavior that isn't class based. In other words, Matz himself has nothing riding on its being class based. I think it's going to stay this way because the closest he's come to an alternative is to talk about a class-like thing that would store these methods. And people kind of politely said, class-like thing? What? How class-like? Can't it just be a class? So I think, he, I think he, at the moment, is taking the position that, that this is kind of a good way to do it. I think it's a really good way, actually. Because um, it gives you a kind of class interface to to these objects and their and their behavior. Oh, and what a catchy phrase! Right? A class interface. Um, essentially, you can you can address the singleton class of an object. I mean, you can get into it just as you can you can open a definition block for it. You can add instance methods to it. The difference is the instance methods you add to the singleton class can only be called on the, the particular object to which you're adding them. So I think, in, in, in fact, the class interface, although again, it, it sort of takes, it certainly means that Ruby is not in the realm of, of strictly prototype languages where there are no classes, there are only objects. Um, Ruby does embrace the idea of classes, but I think in this really kind of nice, elegant way, it kind of brings it full circle so that the class method, that, or the, the class-based the class design is being used to, to individuate objects as well as kind of aggregate them and, and uh, make them similar. Just a couple of things um, in thinking about sort of embracing classes and the idea of a class interface and so forth. Um, there's a couple of, I, I think, kind of pitfalls or um, obstacles, maybe, would be a word. One, one thing that happens pretty regularly in kind of Ruby discussions, Ruby discourse, mailing lists, and so on, um, is that somebody suggests one way or another of um, usually what they refer to as testing the type of an object. In other words, some kind of, you know, whether it be what we call it static typing or, um, or sort of runtime checking or whatever. There's, there's even libraries that people have written that, that will do this so that you have kind of method signatures that say, you know, this method only accepts a string, this method only accepts an integer, and so on. Um, and then you decide whether those rules have been obeyed or not by just by testing the class of the object, testing the, uh, the ancestry, the superclass of the object, the modules that the object um, incorporates, and so on. Then again, there's been a lot of back and forth about this, and this is you know, kind of a position statement on my part as much as anything else. But um, my problem with that, again, I, I think the basic, the fact that there are classes in Ruby I, I, is fine with me. I'm not sort of pining to be, although I am interested in, as I say, in learning more about self and so on. Um, I'm not sort of pining to be in a language that, that jettisons classes completely. Um, but again, Ruby has gone out of its way to make it so that individual objects can have their own lives and you don't, you, you don't necessarily need classes or you, you, they're, they're sort of not the, the be all and end all of what an object is. And one problem that I've seen with, with attempts to write, you know, whether it be kind of pre-processing or, or kind of runtime checking for, for class membership, for class ancestry and so on, one problem is that it doesn't work. Because it only works, let's say, if you decide you are never going to sort of individuate an object based on methods. In other words, if you somehow absolutely decide that if an object is of a certain class, then for all time, membership in that class will define exactly what that object can do, no more, no less. Well, fine, then I suppose then testing for class makes sense. But in fact, objects can change. It's, it's you know, it's, unlikely that, that someone's going to come in and sort of change all the methods in your objects without your knowledge. But it's possible that something, a sort of benign version of that happen. So just saying this is a string or this is, you know, a 
a descendant of class X or whatever, doesn't actually tell you really authoritatively whether that object is going to do what you want or not. Second of all, it circumscribes you, meaning if you decide that all that matters in Ruby is what class an object belongs to, then you're dealing with kind of a subset, I think, of what you can do with the language. And if you decide that, you know, adding singleton methods, adding individual methods to objects, if you decide that that's, you know, too dangerous or too wizardly or whatever, which I, I don't think it is. I think it's, Ruby is designed to make that kind of thing very easy and natural. Um, but if you decide that, that it's sort of bad practice to do that, um, then I think you end up with kind of a subset of the of the language, and it's not it's just not as as suggestive or rich I think, in terms of the, the semantics. Um, and also in terms of this idea of a class interface, just the role of classes in in relation to objects and their individuality. Um, don't underestimate. Class. Singleton classes, um, unfortunately, they've been subject to this really bizarre thing over the years where people just argue endlessly about what to call them. And so we have meta class, virtual class, eigen class, I don't know what else, you know. And it, Matt has not come out with a pronouncement on this. And one wishes he did. But anyway, you'll hear a lot of different names for them. Um, my problem with some of the names, like including virtual and meta, and so on, is that they're not really true. I mean, an object singleton class is itself a class object. It exists. It's an anonymous class object, usually, unless you assign it to something. Um, but it is actually a class object, and, and therefore, I think, you know, is sort of con concrete in that sense. Um, so, just a couple of, of kind of summary things, and I, in a minute I'm going to, as I say, move on to, to show you some uh, code, but just a couple of, um, of just kind of summaries. Um, type is not the same as class, but again, it's the, the type that liberates you from class is, in fact, implemented in terms of a singleton class, class in, in Ruby. Um, and also, in just thinking about type, you know, sometimes people describe type as not only methods, but also attributes and statements. Um, in fact, in Ruby, what we call attributes are methods. They're essentially convenience methods wrapped around instance variables to set and get the instance variables, reader and writer methods. So essentially, an attribute is also just part of the method interface. There's no, at the language level, other than the convenience methods like after an accessor that let me write these things relatively easily. At the language level, there's no separate attribute construct. It's just little methods wrapped around instance variables. Um, so, as I say, I have I have no sort of gripe about classes. I, I actually love the design of Ruby. I think it's really cool. But there is there are a lot of other things to think about in terms of singleton classes. As I, to go back to an earlier point in, in even in terms of sort of best practices when it comes to things like extending objects of core types and so forth, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of techniques and a lot of interesting things you can do. Um, I wanted to show you a little program which I wrote, it's really, it's kind of, um, what's the word, a sort of compendium of just a few techniques. I, I wrote it, if, let's see if I can get the right things onto this screen, and that will be the first challenge. <coughs> let's see, well that's, actually I think I've seen the same screen. Sort of a, a kind of 
kind of proof of concept thing here. I was partly, this goes back a little bit to Dave Thomas's slide about um, its object orientation and, and not um, class orientation. And one of the things that Dave said, as you'll remember from that talk, was next time you write a Ruby program, just, you know, even if it's just kind of as an exercise, try to write it without creating any classes. So I did, and I, I kind of, you know, stacked the deck, so to speak. It is actually a deck of cards program. Um, to kind of just to show you some techniques, and, and I mean, that, it's not necessarily kind of the, the last word in how one would do this, but there's our little shuffle, shuffle hole. Um, but of course, since we want to do things right, we have some tests here, and we'll start looking at the test. I actually have a method called make deck, which creates deck of cards. And I want to make sure that the deck is 52 cards and that they're all different. Um, when I deal five cards, I want to make sure there are 47 left. And I then deal again. I could really consolidate this probably, but I just sort of strung it together to deal. Again, make sure the hand is five when I ask it to be five. Um, a little bit of testing the shuffling. It seems to me there's probably some way to get rid of some of the weirdity of this particular test, but I, this was about the best I could do at the time. Um, basically duplicating the, yeah, with deck dot dupe, did, somehow didn't give me what I wanted. Anyway, essentially duplicating the deck object, shuffling it, making sure that it's still the same size, making sure they're not actually the same, and so forth. So, all right, first things first, right? We go into here and we make sure, yes, all right, tests pass. Okay, so all of that actually works. Now, what are some, as I said, it's a little bit of a catalog of little techniques, but what are some of the things that I've done? Well, one thing is this wonderful method, singleton class. Um, singleton class is a method that has been requested to be put in the core of Ruby. Um, and basically, Max has said it's a really good idea, but he's waiting until he decides what the name should be for singleton. So it might end up being Eigen class or something. Um, one hopes not. So it's actually, you, you will see exactly this, these five lines of code. You will see all over the place because a lot of us get sick of typing this um, and so we define it this way. Is it clear what this method is doing? Anybody want a guided tour of the method? Yes. Yeah, it's not clear. Guided tour, okay. In order to get at the singleton class of an object, the class where methods are defined only for that object, the notation that you use is the class keyword and then this double arrow and the name of the object. So for instance, um, this is a general thing. So if I'm here in IRB and I say, you know, S equals oops, string, if I say class arrow arrow S, I'm now in a class definition block for the singleton class of S. So I can say, you know, def blah, you know, whatever. And now, having defined that in the singleton class, I can now say s dot blah, and it will say hi. So basically, it's similar to, you know, if you just say class C or whatever, but it's a special arrow notation that, that puts you in the, a class definition block for the singleton class of that object. Now here, what I've done is I've gone into that for self. Notice this is defined on object, so yes, I'm messing with the core of Ruby here. But, um, Class, I'm not sure you can have to pronounce this. Class did it itself. Um, Chevron. What? Chevron. Class <laughs> Chevron itself. Um, and all I do here before ending this block, all I do is evaluate self, which is the class object itself. So again, if I say class Chevron S, right, and then I just say self, it's going to give me back the actual class object the anonymous class that is the singleton class of S. So the idea, whoops, sorry, oh, come back. The idea here is 
that it's a matter of just being sort of fair, right? We get to say S dot class and it says string, but we know S really has two classes, so why don't we, whoops, why don't we get to say singleton class? And we don't because it hasn't been defined. So it's become, as I say, a very popular thing to define that. Okay. And actually, in a way, that's the weakest point of this whole program because I, well, you'll see, I kind of, it's my one sort of concession to going into a class definition block. What I've basically done here really is a bunch of modules. And modules, of course, are one of the answers to what to do if you don't want to use, well, that's just, it's not really just as kind of a, a game and not using classes. Modules are really important and, uh, and powerful. And you know some of the ones in Ruby itself, like enumerable and comparable, um, that give you sort of all sorts of methods for free for your, for your own classes. So the somewhat admittedly kind of tortuous name, composed of cards. All right, so composed of cards. Now notice here, this is my, the closest thing to sort of blank slating this I could do. I have obviously suits and ranks for the cards, and I have this card, this sort of prototype card, and it's just a new object. Um, and I have a module called card-like. If you're card-like, you have a suit and rank. That's what it means to be card-like. Now here, what I'm doing is I'm defining a special method extend object. Extend object is a callback. If you define that for your module, and here self is my module composed of cards, then every time an object extends with your module, this callback will be called. With, uh, with the object itself as the argument. So, what I'm doing here is basically I'm adding to the object, and here I'm using the, the chevron as a, in a different semantics, right? This is, it's basically a method. So object had better be something that responds to this or you'll be in trouble, but we're assuming that it will be duck typing, essentially. So, what I do is I basically go through the suits and ranks and I create a deck and for each suit and rank, I clone card, which is a blank object, and I extend it with card-like. Now, why I didn't extend card and then clone it, I can't remember. It looks like that might actually be better. But anyway, the upshot is the same. I end up with a duplicated, car, a new card that's been extended with card-like. What happened to... Where is my, you know what, the, yeah, sorry, there is, there is a line missing from this version. The one where, or what I really should say is, now, there's a test embedded in this one. <laughs> Who sees what's missing? I mean, what we really want is, um, right, object suit. Uh, sorry, um, that's not what we want. What we want is, I remember typing, yeah, this this is unfortunately, yeah, that's what we want. Um, oops. And I don't have any tests that deal with this, so we didn't see it. So card, and then right, card.suit, card.rank, that's R. That, by the way, is a cool little hit. Um, and then we say, Okay, that should that should do it, and hopefully, with the slightest luck, we still pass it. So, although the tests don't address the suit and rank, so that slipped through. But anyway, right? So we create this thing that has um, card likeness, and we give it a suit and rank, and then we add it to our object and return our object. Okay. Dealable, another one, right? Basically, now here, I, admittedly, I'm, I'm leaning toward array semantics, you know, card equals pop. I, it's not going to work too well unless you have an array or unless you have a pop method that does something very array-like. Um, but the basic idea is that you, you go through n times, you, you add each card to the hand, which is an array itself. And if there's a block, this is just, you know, in case you want to examine the cards as they come out, you, if there's a block, it would yield the card to the block as it goes along. Shuffleable is similar to those earlier examples. Um, 
that I showed you. And here we have make. Uh, the, all right, these two are kind of the business end of it. Actually, yeah, add deckness. That was sort of <laughs> um, well, I was thinking, what would it take to have any object, you know, that didn't respond to pop and all those kind of things? How, how over-engineered would it have to be to, to make any? You, know, you have a string, and you say, I want this to be like a, you know, like a monster, a, a conglomerate. I want it to be a string, but also a deck of cards. <laughs> like, what would be involved? Um, it was pretty monstrous. Okay. Um, so essentially, I've kind of broken this out into two. Make deck calls make deck from with an array. Make deck from an object basically just extends the object with my three modules. So there's no deck of cards class. There's no card class. I simply start with an array, and I embellish that array with all the knowledge, that one and only array, right? Not the array class or anything like that, with, with the knowledge that's required. Um, and and that, that ends up, um, as you see, passing the fairly small test suite, but at least it works. So anyway, again, this was partly you know, sort of a puzzle that I, I set for myself and it, it, in response to some of what Dave Thomas was saying. And it is actually very interesting. I do recommend it. I think there's, a, as I said, there's a lot of, um, you know, whether it be extend, um, some of these callbacks in, for modules and classes when they get inherited, when they get included, and so forth. Uh, duping and cloning objects, going into singleton classes, and so on. I'd encourage you, you know, don't, don't look at this stuff as being, you know, so arcane or, um, you know, or dangerous or difficult or whatever. It's one of the cool things about Ruby, maybe the coolest thing, is that it's all really kind of cut from the same cloth. I mean, if you sort of get the idea of what a class is, it's not that hard to get the idea of what a singleton class is, right? It's just a class that stores methods that belong to one object. But it's, it behaves the mechanics of it very much like a class, because it is a class. Um, so anyway, it's all to say that, that per object behavior, you know, rooted as it is in Ruby on, in, in the class structure, I think is, um, is definitely worth, worth sort of toying around with. So, yes? Um, how does defining methods within the singleton class compare to defining methods with the self lab or whatever? Um, it's almost identical, but basically you're asking what's the difference between um, this, right? And this, just def s dot a, right? Is that it? Um, there is some small difference involving the scope of constants. I think, uh, literally, I mean, I, I can't even quite summon it up. I could probably figure it out if I do. But there's some, literally something about the visibility of constants, and it's very arcane. I mean, it's unlikely. In any given case, they're probably interchangeable. Okay. Um, in either case, they both get offended to the signals Right, exactly. Either of those techniques, if you right, if you do, it's basically a kind of shorthand. If you say, you know, def s dot x, you know, and then you you call it, um, yeah, it's basically putting that method in, in the singleton class. So yeah, they have in that sense they have exactly the same effect. What happens if you do you get just the locally declared methods? If you say s s dot singleton class dot methods. Do you get the ones inherited from the class that it, from what's described? Um, if you say, oh, come on. It's not going to let me do, oh, because I'm in X, that's why. Uh, um, is that, I can't see this one. Anyway, uh, I, sorry, going back there. All right, let's. <laughs> so many times that is that suspiciously <laughs> one missing word. Oh okay. So yeah, thank you. Okay. Suspiciously silent. Okay, so if I say S dot singleton class, 
Well, if I say, for instance, instance methods, it, it will show me all of them unless I say false. No, whoops, sorry, that true. No, do I mean true? What is false? Uh, um, no, you know what? That is actually combining the string ones and the non-string ones. Yeah, so it's, at this point, it's actually just calling all the methods together. And yeah, but yeah, together. there is or was that's going to show me its actual methods. Um, uh, okay. I think I'll hit on the right. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, I actually thought that, that get going to the class and asking for instance methods false would do, but apparently it does sort of combine itself and the actual class. Um, but yeah, you can, you can ask the object basically for its singleton methods. There was a hand here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that you were looking at self as another example of a prototype of uh, a prototype language. Do you have uh, looked at JavaScript at all, since that's a readily accessible prototype mm -hmm. uh, language? What have I? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, I'm not a JavaScript expert by any means. But uh, but yeah, JavaScript, um, Lua, this other this scripting language that I think is also prototype. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. The only other thing that was that your uh, singleton class uh, method is very similar to JavaScript's prototype method. Mm -hmm. uh, it acts in that you can add on additional methods that are instance only. Right, well that's what's interesting to me is that in Ruby, you're sort of addressing the object, but through this kind of class interface. You're kind of having a dialogue with, a, with this class. Even though we usually think of class as having arbitrarily many instances here, the, I think this is why Matt's has sort of occasionally been uneasy with the idea of using the concept of a class for this. Because when you think of class, you think of you know one class, many instances. And here it's like, um, it's kind of this weird sort of private relation. And of course, by the way, what I should add, one of the reasons that the name singleton class is so thorny is that there's this other meaning of singleton class, right? The singleton pattern, the class that only has one instance, um, which this is sort of like, but there is actually an implementation of that in Ruby that has nothing to do with singleton classes in this sense, too. Is there another hand? And then I'll probably, should probably wrap up, but yes. I'm sorry, I'm probably just missing something, but the singleton class method that you end up defining in your example at the top, yeah. where do you use it in the rest of your example? Oh. Because I just saw you extending modules, I didn't see you actually calling it. You know what? Um, remember that thing I deleted? <laughs> <laughs> well, so you learned a little about singleton classes. Okay, right. Okay. Yeah, no, actually, yeah, I think, I think it was exclusively in that thing I deleted. So it just goes to show something. But anyway, you'll, I don't regret showing you this. I'll say that. <laughs> you, will, you will see it, and hopefully someday you'll actually see it in the core with some name. Yes? What do you think of the commas? A what? The commas. Um, I, don't, I don't want it, but I know people do. Um, the commas is basically the idea is if one object becomes another, as I understand it, at least so it's been proposed in Ruby, is that then sort of every reference to that object would become a reference to the other object, sort of invisibly or whatever. I don't know. I I I'll defer to pe to the people who um, who really advocate it. And actually, Josh Susser did explain to me one case where he thought it was really good, basically having to do with proxies, and having a proxy only become the object when it really needed to, and that kind of thing. Um, but I'm kind of notoriously a little bit curmudgeonly, I mean, notor you know, not worldwide, but on the mailing list, <laughs> um, yeah, over in, you know, wherever they're talking about. Um, a little bit kind of, I don't know, grudging about new stuff, so. <laughs> So it may just be it's falling into that net. I don't know. I should look at it more. But uh, even 
following the, the namespace discussion at all, the concept that an uh, object in a particular context will appear to have a different set of methods than it will have. The sort of selector namespace thing? Yeah, I actually, I, I, that discussion started at the first Ruby Club in 2001. Um, and it actually started in the wake of my giving a, presenta a presentation of something I'd written, which was a more or less kind of proof of concept library that would let you block scope changes to, to core classes. So you could say, for the duration of this block, array has a shuffle method, and now it doesn't. Right? And there's actually better libraries that do that you know, in a more thread-safe way and so on. Then we started talking about selector namespaces, and I haven't, I, I've kind of lost the thread of, of very recent discussion, but uh, I know there's a lot, that, what, what interests me in a sense is that there's a lot of interest in that, but there, have, there are these libraries that pretty much let you do that, and no one uses them. I've never seen any, they've been there for years. I don't, I don't even need mine, which was, you know, fairly kind of, you know, un, un sophisticated, but there's at least one other that's really thread safe that lets you, you know, kind of pull modules in and out, basically. That kind of um, I always forget it. It's like class something or module or something. Yeah, um, I'll try to find it. It's on RA. So that's the thing. It's all this kind of interest in having that in the language, but I don't know of anybody that's actually really taken advantage. I mean, I, it's not that I monitor every Ruby program every time. Um, but I, there's no buzz about, about it. Let's put it up. All right. Thank you. I even have a thank you slide. <laughs> if I can get the mouse on it. Well, it's really <laughs> <laughs>